would first of all like to obviously welcome Mayor Will Flanagan to BCC. Uh, he's been kind enough. This is actually the third year in a row. Yeah, I look forward to it every year. So we really do appreciate his time. And as I mentioned um, as he came in, that this is uh, my urban government course and also Festa Silver's. What, uh, I know it's paralegal. Uh, but which this is a paralegal course. It's legal research. So. Right? Good. Just to, so I can get an idea. How many are from the legal research? Okay. Very good. Yes. And they're playing bongos next door. I'm not exactly sure why. I think that's that an was, honor of your visit. I'm that's not really fine. sure how it ties into BCC or not. But I was, I was enjoying it, actually. <laughs> Without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Mayor Will Flanagan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. And as the professor stated, this is actually the third year I've come back to speak to the urban government course and now the paralegal studies and research. So I always look forward to coming back here to BCC uh, to speak with the students here and also answer questions. We'll save some time for questions at the end. I think I'll start off just by giving you a little background uh, on how I became mayor and how I got there and talk about some of the issues going on. I'll also focus in on some legal issues too and then we can open it up for questions at the end. So I was born and raised in the city of Fall River. Uh, I went to Diamond Vocational High School. From there I went on to UMass Dartmouth where I studied criminal justice. Uh, from UMass Dartmouth I went on to Roger Williams Law School and I earned my law degree and I was admitted to practice uh, law here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, when I was at Roger Williams I was fortunate enough to receive an internship uh, with the city of Taunton working in their legal department. And after I passed the bar exam, I was appointed as the assistant solicitor for the city of Taunton working on legal issues there, research, writing legal opinions, uh, representing the city uh, on all civil cases. Did that for about two years, and then I went to go work for the Bristol County District Attorney's Office. Uh, I was a uh, prosecutor supervising the Taunton and Fall River District Court, and I handled cases such as OUI, assault and batteries, uh, sexual assault cases, and that was a very, it was a job I really enjoyed being able to be in the courtroom and advocating for victims' rights and making sure that justice was done on the cases that came before me. Then in 2009, I wanted to run for mayor because I was born in this city, raised in this city, I really just had a passion for Fall River. And we ran against a mayor who was really involved. He was, I believe, a 16-year or uh, 30-year uh, state representative. We had several city councilors on the ballot. And then you had me. Um, nobody really knew who I was at the time. I didn't have really any funds raised. Uh, and we ran a real grassroots campaign where we would go door to door talking to people. I think I probably knocked on 10,000 doors that year in the city of Fall River and we finished second in the preliminary uh, and then in the general election uh, through hard work and staying focused on issues we won with over 60 percent of the vote and from 2009 to 2011 uh, I had my first term in office and we had a number of issues we had to deal with uh, as being mayor that first year uh, we had economic development issues at the time and still today city of Fall River has double digit unemployment. We had public safety issues where we had massive layoffs in our fire department and our police department and we also had education issues. Uh, when I first came into office the Fall River public school system was on the verge of being taken over by the state uh, for its failing uh, practices. And also, uh, we had several years of past due audits and we were in financial turmoil and there was a good possibility uh, that the city of Fall River was going to go into receivership. So first day in office, I walk in and all those problems are on my desk. But over the last two years, uh, we really were able to uh, right the ship and get the city to where it needs to be. Uh, from the economic development issue, you know, we still have high numbers of unemployment. Uh, but if you had an opportunity to read the local newspapers or uh, talk to some citizens here in the community, uh, Fall River is really on its way up uh, economically. Uh, when I first came into office, the unemployment rate was about 18.8%, and today it's approximately 14.8%. 
uh, and it's lower this year than it was last year and that's a good sign uh, but still too many people are out of work and we have to get more job opportunities here. <laughs> so front Rachel if you want. Yeah. And so I want to take a second just to really focus on what economic opportunities I'm pursuing here in the city of Fall River. First, if you think about Fall River's history, you know, it was a city that was a textile uh, community. People could go work in one of the mills, whether it be Duro or Quaker or Light O'Lear uh, or Tilson's Rubber, and people were able to make a good living doing that. Uh, in fact, those jobs really didn't require uh, any higher degrees in education. And what you would often see is that mothers and fathers would work there. Uh, then the children of the parents would often <laughs> drop out of school and go work at the mill. And those jobs really help people buy homes. They help people purchase cars and put money in savings accounts and go on family vacations. So they were good paying jobs. But unfortunately, those jobs began to leave this area, go south or go overseas for cheaper labor. And you saw the unemployment levels really skyrocket uh, in the city. So those textile jobs are no longer here. And it's our responsibility, working with my Office of Economic Development, to do our best to diversify our economy. So how do you diversify it? Well, you have a pool of employees who don't have the higher degrees in education. Uh, you also have a pool of employees who maybe English isn't their first language. And those employees are having difficulty going out and finding jobs in the job market. And they're also competing against uh, employ applicants who have associates or bachelor's degrees or sometimes doctorate's degrees. So I've put a strong emphasis on worker retraining, going after federal dollars uh, to have workers who are currently unemployed go through a retraining. And BCC has been great in doing that. You know, every year I go to uh, a, a adult high school graduation here and I hear the stories from the students who dropped out of high school or going back to get their high school diploma and working on associate's degree uh, because they're having difficulty right now in the job market. So worker retraining is something I put a major emphasis on in doing what we could uh, to get the workers ready for today's job market. Also, we are putting a major push on 21st century jobs. We have 300 acres along Route 24, which has been dedicated for our life science and technology park. Uh, jobs in bioscience, green energy, uh, life science, getting those types of companies to locate here in Fall River so we can really lift the image of our community and become a magnet for a lot of these blue chip companies. Now, some of the enticements we use to get these companies here is first we have a lower cost of living than the greater Boston area. It costs less to purchase a house here. Our taxes are lower than the greater Boston area. Uh, user fees for water and sewer are lower than the greater Boston area. And we use enticements like that to get companies to locate here. And currently we're in discussions with some large pharmaceutical companies and bioscience companies to get them to break ground here in Fall River and to open up uh, a company here. And we're working with companies like Meditech, who is a, uh, really a giant in software engineering to get them to expand here in our area. So it's getting those 21st century jobs, jobs that are increasing in demand and not decreasing here uh, in, in our nation to locate here in Fall River. Hopefully with the more job opportunities we have coming in, we're going to see a decrease in our unemployment rate. And a lot of folks may say to me, you know, Mayor, you're getting those companies to come in here, uh, but the current pool of those who are unemployed don't have the skill set to work at those companies. And there may be some truth in that. However, what really bothers me is seeing students who are graduating from two and four year universities who aren't able to find a job in the degree uh, that they went to school for. 
And it's very discouraging to hear those students say, you know, Mayor, I love this area. I grew up here, but I got to move to California or North Carolina to find a job in the field that I paid good money to go to school for. So I'm hoping that the next generation doesn't leave this area. and We don't have what I call a brain drain of people going off uh, to different parts of the world to find employment. And also, you know, I'm pursuing opportunities like casino gaming. Uh, if you've been focusing on uh, the gaming legislation, you know that what we are in Region C, uh, we have a strong possibility of uh, seeing expanded gaming in our area. And I'll go over the gaming bill with you briefly. Uh, the legislature has legalized gaming in Massachusetts. And the way they drafted the gaming bill was they broke the state of Massachusetts into three regions. Region A is the greater Boston area. Region B is western Massachusetts. And Region C is where we are situated. And it's Forever, Taunton, New Bedford, and the surrounding areas, just to give you an example ge geographically of what's located there. So I'm currently in discussions with developers who would like to locate a casino in Fall River. And what would that mean for our area? It would mean three to 5,000 jobs for all skill levels from GED to PhD. And it would be about uh, half a billion dollars in private investment within the community. And I'm well aware of some of the social side effects that come from gaming. But I'm also well aware of the job opportunities it would create for the citizens of our community to get them back to work. So those are just the opportunities we've been exploring uh, for economic development. And also our waterfront is one of them. If you are familiar with Four of His Waterfront, you know that very few communities in Massachusetts have a waterfront as pristine as ours. And when I came into office, I drafted what I called a Waterfront District Improvement Plan, WDIP, uh, which really streamlined zoning on our city's waterfront. Because when I would go out and I would speak to the private sector, they would often indicate frustration with permitting and zoning. And just to give you an example, what I mean by that is, let's say somebody wanted to build on our waterfront. They would have to go to a planning board and get planning approval. They would have to go to a zoning board and get zoning approval. And if somebody at that zoning board objected to their project, they could take them to court and then their, what's called a variance, would get tied up in court for maybe three years, five years. And if a judge was fortunate enough to allow that project to go forward, maybe four years from the first time they filed an application, they would get to build their project. Well, investors aren't going to sit four or five years before they are, are allowed to build something, so they would just take their investment and move it someplace else. So the private sector indicated to me, if you can help streamline zoning and give us what's called zoning as a right, meaning we don't have to go in front of various boards to get permission to build, we would invest in your city's waterfront. So I drafted an ordinance, it went through the proper channels, it was passed unanimously, and now we have streamlined zoning on our city's waterfront. And we're already starting to see benefits from that. I'm working with uh, f tourism to get ferry operators to come to our city, so Forever would have a ferry service to Newport or Block Island that helps build up tourism and gets visitors into your community. I'm working with the private sector to develop vacant mills on our city's waterfront. I know BCC has moved a section of their campus to the city's waterfront. We have restaurants like Jerry Remy's coming in to Fall River. And we're seeing some economic activity on the waterfront, all of which helps bring citizens in the community helps put people back to work, temporary construction jobs and permanent jobs, and helps get some disposable income within the city. So even though we've made improvements in economic development, we're still nowhere where we need to be to get to those mid-90 numbers where it was only 5 and 8% unemployment. Uh, and hopefully, through continuously working hard, we can get back to those single-digit unemployment numbers. Touch upon public safety with you for a moment. And as I mentioned earlier, when I first came into office, we had massive layoffs in fire as well as police. Through working with internally with our finances, uh, 
but also for applying for federal and state grants, we've been able to restaff our fire department and also see an increase in staffing in our police department. And that's important. Public safety is one of the quality of life issues that you really have to focus in on uh, as an elected official because people want to feel safe living in their community and they want business owners want to feel safe in opening their business within the city. So public safety is one of the major issues in urban government that you have to make sure is being addressed in order to improve the quality of life uh, for the citizens of your community. And we rely upon state and federal grants uh, to staff our police and fire departments and it's always a struggle making sure that those grants are reapproved year after year. And I say it's a struggle because uh, right now in Washington, D.C., very little is getting done. Now, I was down in D.C. about two weeks ago meeting with our senators and our congressmen uh, advocating for a safer grant which will keep our firefighters working. And one thing I continuously heard from all of our elected officials is that there's gridlock right now in D.C maybe because it's an election year, uh, but also because there's uh, a lack of communication right now uh, between Republicans and Democrats and with the President uh, to get issues addressed and to get bills passed. So that gridlock affects cities and towns like Fall River and cuts are being made to bring down the uh, national debt and programs that we rely upon here back home are being cut. So as a local elected official, it becomes extremely difficult uh, to operate what needs to be operated if you're seeing your programs cut. Another quality of life issue I want to focus in with all of you is public education. Uh, as I stated earlier, when I came into office, the state was monitoring Fall River and they put us on a recovery plan. Many of our schools were failing uh, and the state was concerned about what was going on here in Fall River. So we worked with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, was commonly referred to as DESE, uh, and we were put on a recovery plan, which focused on improving education here in the city of Fall River. And over the last two years, we completed three out of the four points of the recovery plan, and were slated to complete the fourth point later this year. And public education is very important. And it's important because if your students are dropping out or not getting a quality education in the public school system, then you're going to see other facets, whether it be public safety or economic development, uh, negatively affected by what's going on in your school system. And just for an idea, how many went to the federal public school system? Private schools or out of area for the rest? Out of area. So if you were to walk into the public school system today in Fall River, it's a different place than it was 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, I'm, I'll be 32 on Friday. I graduated from Diamond Vogue in 98, and I have a pretty good memory of still what the public school system was like. And I've toured every single school both private and public within the city of Fall River. And the classroom's a different place uh, than it was 10 years ago. There's more activity going on with, inside the classroom. Technology, the use of technology uh, has increased within the, the classrooms. And we've seen an increase in our graduation rate over the last two years. And also, uh, we're seeing more students being placed in advanced placement courses. And I had an opportunity to look at our, our graduation list and what some of the colleges our students were going to. And a good portion of our students are going on to some really outstanding schools. And that's uplifting to see uh, that our community is beginning to put an emphasis on education, an emphasis that wasn't really there, I believe, 10 to 15 years ago. So those are some of the issues that we focus in on. But one of the most important issues, I believe, outside of economic development and public safety and education is really lifting the self-esteem of the city. And that's something I think you probably all talk about in your urban government class is the way a city is viewed or how the citizens of that city view themselves. And it's discouraging to hear if you're out in the community or really outside of the city of Fall River, anybody talk negatively 
about the city. And sometimes Fall River or New Bedford, uh, they get maybe a negative image in other parts of the state or other parts of the globe. And that's a culture that I've been working very hard to break. So when people talk about Fall River, or they think about Fall River, they don't think about it as a place where crime happens, or they don't think about a place that has low graduation levels, but they think about a place that where good things are happening and economic activity is happening, and it's a place where people want to move to or want to move their business to. And you want to get the citizens feeling good about themselves too, taking them to levels where they thought they never could really achieve. Uh, and you're breaking cycles of really low self-esteem within the city. And those are really the basic, I believe, issues that a mayor has to focus on. It's a difficult job being mayor because unlike governor or even president, you're really at the ground level with the people. Whether you're at the grocery store or in a public park or in a classroom speaking to students, uh, you're really face to face with the community. You're not speaking to them through media or television or radio. You're speaking with them one on one and citizens can stop you at any point to let you know what's on their mind. So you're really at the ground level with people. And I, you know, reminds me of a quote from Lyndon Johnson. He said, no matter how bad my day is going, I can always be mayor of a city or town. So you know, that's coming from a former president. So those are some of the issues that we're focusing on. And just to give you my vision of where I would like to see our city, maybe 10, 15 years from now, more jobs for the people people feeling safe in the community that they live in, quality education for our students, and our citizens having an opportunity to engage in culture or arts within the community. And if you can tackle those simple issues uh, as a mayor, you're able to really see an improvement in the quality of life of the citizens. And I know we have some legal students here today, so I'll just touch briefly upon some legal research and cases that are going on right now. Our legal department uh, handles issues. Uh, if somebody were to sue the city of Fall River, whether it be a uh, violation of their constitutional rights, or let's say somebody hit a pothole and blew out a tire, or somebody was walking on one of our sidewalks and tripped on a crack, and injure themselves, they file suit against the city. Now there's a rule in Massachusetts which only caps the amount of damages at $100,000. And if you can think why they would have such a rule is because if somebody were to be seriously injured within the city and if they were to be very successful in achieving a large lawsuit against the city, it could possibly bankrupt the city uh, that you were suing it in. And at one time there was a rule of law, which I believe was originated in England, which you couldn't sue a government uh, for that very purpose. Uh, so in Massachusetts you have what's called the Mass Tort Claims Act. It caps damages at $100,000, and that's the maximum you would be allowed to receive if you were to sue a city or a town in Massachusetts. And other issues we deal with are writing ethics opinions and legal opinions. Uh, there's laws which guide what public officials can do, both ethically and legally. And if you're a city employee and you have questions whether or not you're within the rules of ethics, our legal department would help you. There's also building codes and zoning codes which our office helps interpret and also writes legal opinions on. So the legal department deals really with everything on the civil end of uh, a municipality. The criminal aspect is handled by the Bristol County District Attorney's Office. So if the police make arrest in a criminal investigation, it's the DA which prosecutes those cases. So our legal department handles everything civilly and we have uh, law clerks and paralegals and attorneys which handle all civil matters within the city. So I've been going for about a little under a half hour now and I'd like to open it up for questions uh, that you may have, projects we're working on, 
responsibilities of a mayor, any legal questions you may have, and I'll do my best to answer those questions. If I can just say one little side note, because we were just mentioning something a moment ago about working, you know, being with the people and you know, seeing the people out at every different place. One of my students, this must have been maybe two years ago, actually ran into you at the local like a pizza place. Sure. And he said because he was in class and he went up to you and started talking, chatting with you about something he was concerned about. I'm not exactly sure what it was. But that it just made me laugh because it was exactly my thought afterwards. If you hadn't come into class, would he ever, A, know who you were, first of all, or second of all, had the willingness to go up and talk to you and express his feelings. He told me what he mentioned. I can't remember now what it was, but it was just an interesting little little experience you're talking about the local you know working with people directly you know one right one you interesting. can't walk up to a president and talk to a president I think so and the governor you can possibly <laughs> but there's always state troopers around him too exactly uh, exactly yeah. so but any questions for the mayor anything that you're one way in the back just the concerns about casinos coming yes. into town and uh, just the, the impact negative impact that it would have on a community Mm -hmm. uh, what sort of studies or research or anything is there out there that says about the negative impact of the uh, community? There's several negative impacts that casino gaming could possibly have on communities. The first one that always comes to mind uh, is having those who may be addicted to gaming, uh, those who would take their paycheck, go to a casino, uh, have an addiction to gaming, and those addictions could affect the family structure. Divorce, uh, alcoholism, uh, you gotta make sure that checks and balances are set up to ensure that those who have an addiction problem are able to get treatment uh, if they so choose to do so. And the way the gaming bill has been drafted a significant portion of the proceeds that will be generated from gaming go into treatment for those who may have an addiction. But right now, if you live in Massachusetts, you can drive an hour to Connecticut and game there. You can drive 30 minutes to Newport or uh, Lincoln, Rhode Island and game. Or you can walk into any convenience store within Massachusetts and play the lottery. So. It's a vice that is around us at all times, and Massachusetts, in drafting their gaming bill, has dedicated funding for those with treatment. So by adding gaming to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you possibly may see a increase in those who become addicted to gaming or get addicted to gambling, but there's also those who say, well, gambling's already here, and if those who want to game, they have the opportunity to do so. You're also gonna see an increase in traffic. People are going to come to your community to game that may have not come to your community for any other reason. And I looked at studies that were done in Connecticut around Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun, and you would think you would see an increase in violent crimes. Actually, the studies did not indicate that. The increases you did see, though, were focused around DUI or OUI, drunk driving. Uh, those leaving the casino uh, may have been drinking before they left and police officers have been stopping them after they leave the casino and OUI charges have been resulting from that. Just but, to interrupt for a second, sure. are those casinos on reservations though as opposed to being in residential areas? Like, obviously zoned for commercial purposes, but like right in the heart of like residential areas? They're in residential areas. Foxwoods is in a residential area. Mohegan is, you pass through a residential area to get there, but they are on reservation land. So the Native American tribes took those portions of land into trust. And just to briefly go with you what that means, you have a Native American tribe. They have ownership of a parcel of land. And then in Washington, D.C., they go in front of the Indian Bureau of Affairs, the IBA, and they file for an application to take land into trust. The IBA grants the Native American tribe to take land into trust and they become their own sovereign nation. 
where they have their own laws uh, on that sovereign nation and they're not subject to the laws of the state of Connecticut uh, at that time. In Fall River, the ideal or what we have been pursuing is commercial gaming, meaning it would not be uh, Native American tribes that are in ownership of the gaming license, but it would be a commercial enterprise that would be subject to the rules of Fall River, Massachusetts, and also the United States. And there's just one other uh, negative aspect I want to touch upon with you, is how a casino affects surrounding businesses. If done incorrectly, you would see potentially businesses close around that casino. If you think about it, uh, restaurants would be there, so the demand for other restaurants in the area would go down. Uh, hotel rooms would be there, so possibly hotel demand in other parts of the area would go down. And you may see a negative effect on surrounding businesses located near a casino. If done correctly, and it was really the Foxwoods model that did this, when I speak with the folks who uh, were the starters of Foxwoods, they actually engaged the Chamber of Commerce and local business and gave those local businesses an opportunity to open up a business with inside the casino. What they also did was they would have promotions in the casino which allowed you to have a discount at one of the local businesses, meaning if you stayed at Foxwoods, you would get 10% off at the local museum or you would get buy one, get one free at a local restaurant. Foxwoods was given the incentive to the businesses for those discounts, so it was a way to promote tourism within the community. And also, you know, I remember a, an interesting story where the CEO of Foxwoods actually sat down with the local uh, churches and the priest or the deacon would go into Foxwoods, Foxwoods would give the deacon or the priest gaming chips and the priest would then hand those out at the Sunday Mass because the priests were concerned that uh, they would lose revenue from their bingo games which help fund the church. So they were going there getting a revenue off the casino and then giving it back to their parishioners and that way the churches weren't affected uh, by the casino opening up in that area with their super bingos. So before you were to break ground on a casino, you would have to make sure that you were putting the best proposal forward. And also, the local community would have to vote on whether or not they wanted that casino to be in their city or town. So there are negative impacts, but also the positive impacts of putting people back to work, both temporary and permanent jobs, and also having a tax revenue uh, received from the investment that's occurring on that site. That tax revenue was then redistributed into the community to hire teachers or invest in public education, to invest in public safety, and to make infrastructure improvements within your community. So there's negative and positives on both sides of the issue, and at the end of the day, the public would vote on whether or not they wanted to have such a facility uh, in their community. You have a question. As a homeowner, Talking, yes. Talking. Yes. I am more concerned with what it's going to do to my property value. So, wouldn't that affect property values? Because people aren't going to want to buy in a place where there's a casino. So, pretty much you're you, the creek without a paddle. Right. You know, so that's going to affect not just people in that area, but your entire town. If you live near the casino, you may see a decrease in your property value and that would make it more difficult for you to sell your home at some point. And that's frustrating for a property owner that does live in that vicinity. So I believe your vote is June 4th or somewhere around that time period. And it'll be interesting to see how that vote turns out. I think it's gonna pass in Taunton if I had to guess. <laughs> just because the economic uh, recession that cities and towns have been in 
uh, throughout the last five to ten years. Uh, but living in the area, I can already guess probably how your vote's going to go. Uh, and uh, Taunton, I, because of the proposal that's in that community, I think it's going to be difficult for the casino to develop there because that casino license is being pursued as an Indian gaming license. So there's four hurdles that the Mashpee Wampanoag have to clear. One, they have to get an option on the land. They've cleared that hurdle. Number two, they have to have a referendum vote. That will be June 4th. And if the public passes it by 51% of the vote, they've cleared it. Number three, they have to enter into what's called a compact with the governor. Because it's going to be reservation land, uh, they have to make arrangements with the governor of Massachusetts on payments, meaning how much they'll pay to the government to be able to operate that casino. That compact also has to get approved by the state legislature, I believe by August 1st. But the legislature will be going on vacation sometime around that period, and it's very difficult once they break for vacation to get them back in to the House and Senate to vote on that compact. So even though they may enter into a compact with the governor, I don't know if they're going to get it voted on in time to satisfy that third requirement. And the final requirement they have to satisfy, which I think is very, very difficult for them to do, is uh, take land into trust. There was a decision, if you haven't read it yet, I, I, you should Google it and read it. Uh, Salazar, Cacieri versus Salazar. Cacieri at the time was the governor of Rhode Island, and there was a dispute that erupted between uh, the governor and the Narragansett Indians. Uh, and what that decision ultimately says is that after the 1930s, if you were a federally recognized tribe, you have, you're not able to take land into trust. The Mashpee Wampanoag were recognized after that 1930s time frame. So for them to take land into trust, they would need either an act of Congress or uh, for the president to make an exception for them to take it in. Both of those are extremely difficult, especially given the gridlock we have on Congress right now. They can't even pass a jobs bill, never mind uh, having them decide whether or not a Native American tribe in Taunton can take land into trust. So even though there will be a vote June 4th, I'd be surprised to see ground being broken in Taunton for a casino. That means don't take it seriously, still show up to vote and do your part to voice your opinion on it, but I don't, the, I think the odds are against it. Affect the whole, if, if you're already in economic turmoil, right. property values are already at sure. ridiculously low amount. Mm -hmm. Isn't this going to push that even further and make it even harder for people to pay their, their mortgage, pay their finances, all that stuff? Well, it may. Everything just kind of. Well, let's look at the opposite side of the issue. If you're not working right now, or you can't find work, you're not meeting your mortgage, you're not meeting your car payment. You are getting notices in the mail from your bank saying they're going to foreclose on your home. Uh, the repo company is coming and taking your car out of your driveway. And uh, it's probably causing very much high levels of difficulty within the household itself. You get a job. You're working hours. Uh, you get a paycheck. You're able to put money back into your savings. You stop paying your bills down one by one, and you start to get back on your feet. And casino jobs are not bad paying jobs. Uh, people can make a very good living by working at a casino, whether they're working in uh, maid services, or they're dealing blackjack, or they're the CEO of the company, or, any, or the attorney for the company, or the treasurer, or the CFO for the company, you're getting a paycheck probably higher than you would working a uh, other job within the community. Or oh, the level of pay is probably just as good. So you're getting money back into your pocket and that's helping you get back onto your feet. So that's the other side of it. Uh, will it affect property values within the area? It may. You know, and I think that's something you would have to look at in a study to see the effect 
of property values within that area. I know Mayor Hoy <coughs> has commissioned a study in Taunton to see what the effects are. Uh, it would be interesting to see who's paying for that study uh, because whoever's paying for it may have an outcome on what the uh, final draft does say. So that's something you may want to know in looking at it. But there's, like I said earlier, there's positive and negative effects both ways from it. And I have time for one more question. You had your hand up. Yeah, well, changing gears towards education and employment. For students who want to work in the criminal law field, upon graduating law school, how great are the employment opportunities for employment in criminal law in the Bristol County, either working for the DA's office or um, public defenders? Right now, I w I'll give you an example. Uh, I have a w attorney who went to Roger Williams, uh, very capable of getting a job, passed the bar in Massachusetts, who can't find work as an attorney. He's applied everywhere and nobody's hiring at this time. So just to keep his skill set fresh and to build up his resume, he comes into the legal department twice a week for free to work as an intern, not getting paid, but he wants to ensure that he's not losing his skills as an attorney uh, and he's also helping to build up his resume. Uh, if I can give advice to individuals who are looking to go into that field would be to, number one, excel in your studies, meaning do the best you can to graduate within the top of your class so you can set yourself apart from the other applicants going out for a job. Get as many internships as possible while you're in school, whether it be BCC or UMass or, or, or one of the law schools, and to network the best that you can, meaning going to uh, after school events or joining uh, local groups so you can meet people. The more networking that you do, the more impressive your resume is, the more or the greater the likelihood of you getting that job interview. And then once going on that interview, knocking it out of the park uh, to get a offer for a job. And I know the DA's office is always accepting internships. I know I'll pass out a paper for those who want to do an internship, whether with the mayor's office or any department within City Hall. Uh, we'll, we would love to have you. And the economy is still in a recession right now. So companies are less likely to hire. And those government agencies are always under fire in seeing their uh, operating budget cut. So you probably will have a better chance, I would think, two, three, five years from now in getting hired to work in the criminal justice field than you would do today just because the freezes that are on or the lack of hiring that's occurring. But yes, are you interested in going to law school? Yes, either um, I want to prosecute or work for um, public defense. So. In Massachusetts, Massachusetts is different than Rhode Island. Rhode Island, you have what's called a public defender's office. So it's a state agency, it's funded through the state, and you get uh, a paycheck or employed by the state. Massachusetts really has what's called, it, it's a system where you're a private attorney, you have your own shingle, you have your own office, however, you go what's on a list. And they call the list, so one day you may be in forward district court, the next day you may be in Attleboro district court, and then you bill the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for the cases that have been assigned to you. So a defendant would go into court, they would fill out a financial form, and if they qualify for an attorney, one would be assigned to them. And if you're on the list, that would be your client, you would represent him, and then you would bill the state for whatever rates are applicable for, uh, for what you bill on. Is it hard to get on that list? It's not hard to get on there. There is a waiting list. However, I know attorneys who are leaving the DA's office because the pay is not high enough for them, they're going on the list and receiving an increase in pay by taking on more clients. So 
just to break it down, excel in school, network, and just really knock it out of the park when you go on a job interview. And I think your chances are greater than getting hired, for, for getting hired. When I look at a resume as an employer, first thing I do is critique that resume to see what they have on there for education, for activities, for prior work history. Bring them in for an interview, do an assessment at that interview, then make a determination based upon the assessment if that person would be a good fit for the office that they're applying for. And I think employers, that's just probably what employers do in, in determining whether or not somebody's going to get hired. But as a government agency, there's only so much funding that you have, and that funding is constantly under attack from being cut. So it becomes more difficult to increase your staffing levels and get the job done that needs to be done. I, passing out uh, a description for an internship, is the contact info on there, Perry? Yep. So if you're interested in either working, uh, interning with the mayor's office or the legal department or any other department within City Hall, please uh, take a look at that uh, and then contact who needs to be contacted on it. And I think Perry will have an interview scheduled for you. So I'd uh, love to have you during the summer break if you're not taking any courses that would conflict uh, with you doing the internship. And again, thank you for having me here. Thank you.